After Jesus has calmed the storm, the boat reaches the other side of Galilee. He who has shown himself to have power over diseases and over the elements of nature will now show that he has power and authority over 2,000 demons. Demons are angels who rebelled against God long before the creation of human beings led by Satan, the reason, pride, independence, self-reliance, the very things that keep us from God. The difference between angels and men is that a certain number of angels were created, and that was it. Angels don't procreate. Angels don't multiply. And angels don't die either. The angels and demons you find in the Bible are the same ones that have been around for thousands of years. Because they were not victims of an external stimulus or temptation, as Adam and Eve were, who were tempted by Satan in the guise of serpents, and also because they did not die, there is no forgiveness or salvation for angels who have sinned. But for humans there still is. Contrary to what you see in the comics and movies out there, demons don't live in hell. They are going around circling between heaven and earth and opposing all that is of God. Does God want to save? The demons want to destroy. Does God want to deliver? The demons want to enslave. Does God want to relieve? The demons want to upset. But demons not only influence or harm human beings, they can also dominate, invade people, invade their bodies, as was the case with those two men, processes, whom Jesus encountered as soon as he landed in the region of Gadara. Two thousand demons had taken possession of these men, who lived madly, deranged in the midst of the tombs. The demons immediately recognized Jesus as the Son of God and worship him. They asked him why he had come to bother them before his time. Yes, because there will be a day when Satan and his angels will be condemned to the lake of fire, which was originally prepared for them, not for men. Jesus frees those two men by casting out the demons and allowing the demons to enter more than 2,000 pigs that were in the place. The pigs, processed, crazed, enraged, throw themselves over the cliff and drown in the sea. Then they confirm that the vocation that demons have of killing and destroying. Now, these two men are completely freed into their own self-control and are in their right mind and talking to Jesus. Meanwhile, those who took care of the pigs rushed to town to tell the townspeople what had happened. The people of the place immediately come to meet Jesus. But it's not to celebrate or thank him for saving two lives. No. But they came to mourn the loss of 2,000 pigs before the presence of Jesus caused a greater harm. They asked Jesus to get out of there. You will probably do that. Same if you give more importance to pigs than to Jesus. But while some cling to their pigs, others do their best and impossible to bring a sick friend to Jesus to be set free. But that's the story I'm going to tell you for the next three minutes. Last three minutes you have seen Jesus demonstrate that he has power over demons or fallen angels, over the sea, over the winds, over the storm. Now he will reveal that he knows people's thoughts and that he has the authority to forgive sins? Do you still have doubts that we are before God made man? The friends of the paralytic do their best to bring the sick man to Jesus. They are forced to lower the stretcher, with the sick man on it, through an opening in the roof of so many people who crowded the door of the house where Jesus was. was. Does Jesus see their faith, that of their friends, and that of the paralytic, and heal the man? No, not yet. First, he forgives your sins. That's right, he says. Your sins are forgiven. In the face of this, some religious Jews think to themselves, This is blasphemy. Jesus reads their thoughts and heals the paralytic to show that he has power for both. Why did the Jews consider it blasphemy to forgive sins? Because only God can do that. Now pay attention to people's reactions. The crowd is amazed when they see the paralyzed man walk. But that didn't happen when Jesus did the most important thing, which was to save this man by forgiving his sins. No one applauded. That's just the way it is. We are amazed at what is visible. But the person who really believes in Jesus, it is concerned with the invisible world, the one that does not depend on the eyes but on faith. The preachers out there promise health and prosperity, luck in love, 
and they are extremely popular for doing so. What few people realize is that health, prosperity, and romantic relationships have an expiration date. While the forgiveness of sins does not, this one is eternal. When technology allowed man to explore the underwater world, we discovered that there is much more life in the water than outside of it. When faith looks into the unseen world, it sees the things that are really important. We are preoccupied with what appears and judge according to appearances, for example, would you want to be seen around with thieves, corrupt people, and prostitutes? It was people like this that Jesus attracted and continues to attract. But that's the subject of the next three minutes. In the next three minutes, we saw Jesus forgive the sins of a paralytic, and he went to heal him. The visible miracle of healing amazed the crowd. But the invisible miracle of the forgiveness of sins and of that man's salvation did not. It only generated indignation among the religious. After all, only God could forgive sins. Matthew, the author of the gospel, is a sinner. He knows that. He has conviction after all. Being a tax collector in those days in Israel meant having one of the most hated professions. Publicans were known to levy unjust taxes for taking advantage of their position to enrich themselves illicitly and were also considered traitors after all. They worked, collected taxes for Rome, their enemy, the invader. Jesus sees Matthew, meets Matthew at the tax office, and he calls Matthew. And Matthew leaves everything behind and follows Jesus. Many hear this call, this invitation, but few are willing to embark on this adventure of a personal relationship with the Son of God, with the one who came to call sinners and has the authority to forgive sin. Matthew prepares a feast for Jesus at his home and invites his friends, obviously publishing people like him and others of questionable reputation. How can your master eat with publicans and sinners? The Jewish religious asked the disciples of Jesus. That was inconceivable to the religious who did not mix with people of this ilk. Jesus said to them, The healthy don't need a doctor. And he goes on to say, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The message is clear. You're tired of hearing doctors say that cancer is curable when it's diagnosed in time. For those who are not sick, there is no cure. The same is true of sin. And Jesus has more to say to those religious who consider themselves better than others, because they lived according to the precepts, the practices of their religion, he says. I want mercy, not sacrifices. And God can only exercise his mercy, which is infinite, when he encounters a convicted sinner. Like Matthew, someone who knows that he doesn't have an atom of goodness to offer to God, to exchange for the forgiveness of his sins. Someone like that. Someone who knows that no sacrifice is needed can save it. It doesn't exist. That you do. Someone who understands that the only efficacious sacrifice that can save us, God has already provided. The death of his son on the cross to pay for our sin. Those religious Pharisees would never understand God's mercy and grace, as long as they continued to think that salvation was by merit, by keeping the law, by precepts, by commandments, try to mix these things up. up. Grace and law and good works was the same as patching new cloth on old garments. Well, that's the subject of the next three minutes. Son who for the past three minutes had been questioned as to his suitability for eating with the corrupt and sinners, now reveals yet another glimpse of who he really was, the bridegroom. When some ask why John the Baptist's disciples fasted and Jesus' disciples did not, Jesus draws a clear distinction between the past and the present. It didn't make sense for the bridegroom's guests to fast now that the bridegroom was there with them. The message to any good Jewish understander was clear. In the Old Testament, God is called the bridegroom. Here Jesus also announces his death. There would come a day when the bridegroom would be thrown. This shows that his death was not an accident of history, but was something that was part of a bigger, much bigger plan. People needed to understand that even John the Baptist had established a way for God to deal with man. By then, man had been tested under the law, the law that was given to Moses. 
and it had become clear that no one would be able to be saved by obeying the commandments. No one could cue. Here now was the only one capable of obeying Jesus, the Son of God, who was also about to switch places with us. He would put himself in the place that we deserve to be, under God's judgment and in death, and he would put us in the place that he had by nature, and that we did not deserve to have heaven. But it wouldn't be possible to do that, or it wouldn't be possible for you to receive it, by mixing the old way of God dealing with man, the Old Testament law, and the new way now, unmerited grace or favor. It would not be possible to try to be saved by works, by good works, when God wanted to save by grace, regardless of conduct or good works. Trying to mix things up would henceforth be like sewing a patch of new cloth onto an old dress. The tear would get even bigger, or like storing new wine still fermenting, still fermenting, in old leather bags, the wineskin. The old choir has already lost its elasticity. It will break. Isn't that just what the Christian religions try to do, borrowing things from the Old Testament? They borrow not only the idea of salvation by obedience to the commandments, but also external elements of the worship of God. Yes, you don't find in the doctrine that is given to the church by the apostles in their letters, the so-called epistles, such things as temples, clergy, priests, making a middle ground between God and men, or else wearing collars and garments, distinguished clothing, to differentiate themselves from those they call laymen. There's that. It doesn't exist. Don't you also find in the letters of the apostles altars, nonsense, rituals? The list is endless. Read the letters of the apostles, and you'll see that there's a huge difference between what the early Christians did and this Christianity masquerading as Judaism that you find out there. The difference between salvation by good works and grace, the difference between Judaism and Christianity, is as great as the difference between death and life. And Jesus is about to demonstrate all his power by bringing a dead girl back to life. But that's in the next three minutes.